It started as an innocent medical experiment. Old people would get an email, a simple formal message telling them that they are likely to die during the next year. The email was sent by a bot, an algorithm that gathered people's medical data and calculated when their last year on Earth would likely begin. The system was made so the elderly could start having conversations with their doctor about their end-of-life care. Sure, it felt cold to some people. A blank message estimating your remaining time, but it was useful. That was until things got out of hand. The bar started telling these messages to everyone. Adults, teens, and even children would get them, telling when their last year would start. The system also started to give dates exactly when the person would die. The algorithm got so accurate that it would even predict the time it would happen. First the world held its breath. Would the predictions come true? Then the reports started coming in. People dying all over the world on the exact date and time the bot predicted. The people who started the experiment tried to delete it, but they couldn't. It seemed like it had a mind of its own and it wasn't going anywhere. Everyone freaked out. People tried to prevent their deaths in any way they could. They started changing their lifestyles, stopped smoking, started exercising and eating healthier. When the day came, people would lock their doors and spend the whole day in bed. But nobody could escape their death date. Humanity tried seeing the bright side of things. The death date got turned into a celebration. A person would invite the people, everyone they loved, most to celebrate their life and say goodbye. People started preparing when they got the email, making wills and completing their bucket list. It almost turned into a positive thing. No more sudden, unexpected deaths. No regrets of dying too soon. People accepted their fate with open arms and left this earth with their hearts full. But not me. I got the email three and a half months ago. It's always sad when miners receive their death date. Mine was two weeks before my 18th birthday, but I couldn't accept it. Not me. Some bot couldn't decide when I was going to die. If someone should have that power, it should be me. I decided to shoot myself as a last act of mutiny against the system, just to prove that I didn't have to obey it. So when I finally pressed the trigger, I felt free. A sharp pain exploded in my head, radiant everywhere in my body. I fell to the ground, waiting for my vision to fade and my heart to stop beating, but nothing happened. I heard a cheerful voice in my head. The gates of hell will open 8 months, 14 days, 10 hours and 5 minutes and you will be deemed to eternal torture. Enjoy your waiting period. I lay poolside perfecting my tan for the start of school next month. Mom was in the kitchen cooking her famous fettuccine alfredo, and Dad was on the way home with a movie from Redbox. My life was perfect, but everything was about to change with the arrival of a new neighbour next door. He was a former police officer, probably mid-fifties, possessed a firm drill sergeant-like tone, but was very friendly and talkative. Initially, he seemed like a good fit for the neighbourhood. He was cordial, always made an effort to wave or say hi, and in the presence of someone with a law enforcement background, provided a sense of security. But things began to unravel quickly and the catalyst seemed to be me. My neighbour took a sudden and keen interest in me. Whenever I went outside, I could feel his eyes examining me. He would always wander over and try to start conversations with me. But as soon as he heard or saw my parents, he would leave. He asked me if I had any social media accounts. When I lied and said no, he asked if he could take a picture of me and proceeded to snap a pic before I could reply. I 
felt completely unnerved and frightened about his intentions for me. For all I knew, he could have been a murderer or a pedophile living a mere foot from our home. I knew I needed to delve deeper. So, one night, I aimed my telescope at his window, and what I saw only amplified the alarm bells going off in my head. The man was fixated on the picture of me on his phone, and I could even see a small stack of photos on his nightstand. A young girl's image on top. My blood ran cold as this all but confirmed my fear. He must be a pedophile. The next night I saw him sneakily rummaging through our trash can. I watched in horror and disbelief as he removed my used tampon, got into his car and sped off into the night. This was the final straw. I knew that in the morning I would have to alert my parents and get in contact with the police. I awoke to the sound of police sirens and a loud commotion downstairs. I hopped out of bed and saw my parents being taken away in handcuffs. I started screaming and crying as I rushed towards the door, but I was stopped by the neighbour. With a horrified expression, he muttered, I'm so sorry. Those aren't your real parents. You were kidnapped and missing for the last 14 years. A DNA test confirmed it. My wife is passed out when the nurse comes in. She says congratulations before looking at my unconscious wife in the hospital bed. The nurse is holding our firstborn daughter, Jude. She is cradling her and gently rocking her side to side. May I hold her? I whisper to the nurse. She looks at me and smiles, the red lipstick and the white teeth making quite the contrast. The nurse nods and walks over to me. I take my new daughter into my arms, and I am sure to be the happiest man alive. I gently place my finger on her cheek and whisper words that I'm not even sure truly exist until this very moment. The nurse gently touches my shoulder. She's whispering, I'll hold on to her until your wife wakes up. She extends her arms and I glance towards my wife. She has her mouth hanging open after an exhausting 13 hours of labor. I nod and hand the newborn to her. The nurse smiles and steps out of the room. I sit down by my wife's bed and am just in awe of the moment. Being a father. I place my hand on my head and smile. I lay back in the chair and close my eyes. Suddenly I am in a new world where Jude is older and a second child is on the way. A new house, a bigger car, Kids' graduation, marriage, our retirement, and first grandkids. My wife and I seated on a bench during sunset, elderly, in our prime years. Andrew, she says, looking at me. I look towards her. Andrew, you couldn't save her. You couldn't save us. I snap back awake. I realize I'm in the hospital bed my wife was in, and she's missing. I stand up. Panic fills me as I rush to the exit of the room. The hospital hallway is busy. I grab the first nurse I see, an older lady. Excuse me, where is my wife? The nurse glances at me and the patient name on the room door. She's in intensive care still. What about my daughter? The nurse makes a sad look and looks at the ground. She then glances back up at me. Is there someone I should call? You don't seem, where is my daughter? I interrupt her. The nurse stares at me and then motions me back into the room. I sit down on the bed I awoke from and look at her, willing her to continue. Your wife gave birth to a baby girl last night. 
After the delivery, an imposter dressed as a nurse poisoned your wife and took the baby. We explained this to you yesterday and you fainted. She looks at me, letting the words sink in. The police are looking for the imposter and your daughter. Intensive care is doing what they can to save your wife. 